welcome to Open Intel digging into the DNS with an industrial size digger. Um, this has nothing to do with the CPUs of the same name. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Nope, nope. <laughs> um, our, our presenter here probably um, constructed something like a Binford 9000 DNS scraper, or something like that. He will probably will tell us a lot more about it. So please, a warm round of applause to Roland van Rijswijk Dai. <laughs> oh. And, and please give a warm round of applause to our Herald here, who pronounced my name correctly, which never happens. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for showing up early in the morning. I really appreciate it, because when I drove here this morning, I thought, oh, I have to talk in the second slot in the morning on a, at a hacker conference. That's going to be hard, but it's great to see uh, quite a full room. Um, I apologize for the white background. They didn't tell me the screens would be like this, so if it's a little bit blinding, it's entirely my fault. Um, first, a little bit of an introduction about who am I, so you know who's talking to you. Um, I work for SurfNet, the National Research and Education Network in the Netherlands, um, where I'm mostly an R&D guy, but I'm also responsible for DNS operations. Um, anybody in the room who doesn't know what DNS is, please wave now, and you might want to leave. Great. Um, so I'm also a researcher at one of our universities here in the Netherlands. Um, I work at the University of Twente, where I recently became not that kind of doctor. Um, and I've worked in sort of network security for the past 16 years, and that's been stuff to do with networking, but also applied crypto, stuff with smart cards, um, you name it. And uh, on the left you see my big hobby, which is scuba diving, and, and this is kung fu diving, as you can see. So why am I wearing this loud shirt? Um, so today, the biggest pride in the Netherlands takes place, which is in Amsterdam. And I had to choose, go there or come here. And obviously, I chose to, co to come here, right? Because this is great. <laughs> but this is a hacker conference, people. So please celebrate diversity if you're here. Right, now to the content of the talk. So I'm going to get a little bit more serious, and hopefully, you'll laugh somewhere along the way. Um, we started a research project where we wanted to measure the DNS at a large scale. Uh, and this project we started about two and a half years ago. Um, and then the first obvious question is, why would you want to measure the DNS, right? Because um, the DNS is part of every network service. Um, and it tells you a lot about the state of the internet, right? Because the DNS has a very important function in the internet. It translates human readable names into machine-readable information, and it also does some stuff in uh, sort of service discovery uh, or um, tell you where you need to deliver mail for a domain or stuff like that. So what is in the DNS over time, and the, the clue here is over time, can tell you something about the evolution of the Internet, something about the security of the Internet, the stability, um, and we wanted to make sure that we get as much data as we can, and that's what this talk is going to be about, and what you can learn if you have that data. So the first obvious thing to talk about is people have been measuring the DNS for years. Um, there are probably people in the room from the CSIRT and CERT community uh, that are aware of passive DNS, um, and passive DNS was in sort of thought about uh, thought of by a guy called Florian Weimar uh, in 2005. Uh, and basically, uh, what he said was, why don't we record the traffic between uh, a DNS resolver and authoritative name servers on the internet? And then we store that data and we aggregate it at a central spot. And actually, there are two huge deployments of this on the internet today. One is operated by a US company called Farsight Security. And the other, which is probably less well known, but probably just about as big, is operated by the Austrian National CERT team. Um, and we, as in SurfNet, contribute to the second one because we don't want to contrib contribute to uh, um, uh, uh, something that is for a commercial company and that's also used by certain agencies in the United States. Um, so we did not go for passive DNS. We, we went for active measurements. Why did we do this? Well, passive DNS has one problem, is, and it, this is that it suffers from bias. And that makes it unsuitable for the kind of work that we want to do, which is to track the state of the DNS over time. The problem with passive DNS is that it will only see information for domains that clients of the resolvers where you capture traffic 
are actually interested in. So that means that the domain has to be used first before it is observed by a passive DNS sensor. And if you want to track the entire state of the DNS, also less popular domains or domains that haven't been actively used yet, um, you won't see them in a passive DNS setup. Another issue is that you have no control over the query frequency. If a domain is less popular, you might get one data point every week. If it's very popular, you might get tons of data points that you then have to deduplicate, so it's a bit of a management nightmare as well. So we decided to go a different route. What we decided to do is to do active DNS measurements. Uh, and what we do is we send a comprehensive set of DNS queries for every name in a top-level domain once per day. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the specific queries we do so you have an idea of the kind of information that we uh, gather. Now, we do this at scale. Um, our current measurement covers around 60% of the global namespace, and that has all the large generic top-level domains, such as Comnet, Org, um, and some others. But we also have quite a few uh, country code domains uh, for, for instance, Netherlands, Sweden, Canada, uh, but also the Russian Federation. Uh, in addition to that, we look at all the new GTLDs, uh, like useful domains like .xxx or um, .berlin or .friesland in the Netherlands. Um, and I can already tell you that most of those new GTLDs are full of sh crap, shit. Um, in total, we measure over 200 million domain names every single day. Um, and our challenge was, how do we do this in a responsible way? Because we mustn't overburden the global DNS, right? We want to do a measurement, not a denial of service attack. Um, and we need to store and analyze this data efficiently, because I can tell you this generates quite a bit of data every day. So. To give you an overview of, of what our architecture looks like, um, it's built up of three components. On the left-hand side of the figure, you see our, co our sort of um, collection server that collects all the zone files for the top-level domains that we measure. Um, we have contracts with the TLD operators to get their zone files every day, uh, sometimes up to two times a day. And we collect that stuff and put it in a database. Uh, and then we keep track of the daily changes and we keep track of the current state of the zone so that we can actually control our measurement. The middle part is probably the most important because that is where we uh, do the actual measurement. Now we have uh, set up sort of a distributed measurement system where we have one central node per top level domain that sort of controls the measurement uh, uh, during the day. Uh, it hands out chunks of work to a cloud of workers. Uh, so we have a, a hypervisor where we have lots of little VMs running that do the measurement. And they simply ask, oh, do you have some work for me to do? And then we will send it a batch of work to do, and it will do a measurement. And then it will send off, once it's finished the batch of domains to measure, it will send it off to a central aggregation point at the university, um, where we do two things. We put the measurement results onto a large uh, storage array for long-term storage, because we want to keep e uh, track of multiple years of data. Uh, and right now, for the domains that we've been measuring for the longest time, we have about two and a half years of data. Um, but we also have a Hadoop cluster that I'll tell you a little bit about um, in the next couple of slides. So what do we actually query uh, and store? So on the left-hand side, you see all the um, record types that we ask for. Um, so of course, we start with the uh, SOA record, which should be in every uh, DNS zone and tells us a little bit about how the zone is configured in terms of how often is it refreshed, when was it last uh, changed, and things like that. Obviously, we want to capture the A and Quad A records that are in there, not just for the Apex records, so the domain name itself, but also for the www label. Uh, and then we ask for the name server set, mail exchangers, text records, uh, and we ask for some DNSSEC-specific records, so uh, for a delegation signer record, um, to find out if there is a secure delegation, we ask for the DNS key, um, so we can track, for instance, changes in DNSSEC signed domains, and we ask for authenticated denial of existence records by sending a query for a name we know will not exist. What we store is all the records that we get back in the answer section. So on our worker VMs, we run a custom piece of software that we developed ourselves, uh, and I'll give you a link at the end of the talk to a paper where you can read all about that. Um, we send the query to the resolver, and then whatever comes back in the answer section of the response is what we store. So we discard all the stuff in the additional and authority sections, 
because we have no guarantee that the data in there makes sense. Uh, but what we want is what is in the answer section. Then because we send uh, our queries to a resolver that runs on the measurement host, we actually get all the CNAME expansions, so we store those as well. And then we store all the DNS tech stuff that's in there, so if we get signatures back, we store those. And um, finally, uh, we record some metadata, such as uh, we do a GeoIP mapping for all the IP addresses that we get back in A and Quad A records. Uh, and we um, try to map the IP addresses to an autonomous system. Um, this makes it a little bit easier for us to analyze the data afterward. Um, since the beginning of this year, we also have a separate, what we call infrastructure measurement. And what we do there is we take all the NS and M MX records that we get, get back from the main measurement, and then we do an A and a, qu and a quad A query for those uh, names, and we're gonna be extending that with additional uh, query types uh, later this year. Right, so we measure about 11 to 12 queries per domain for 200 million domains, so you can do the math how many queries that is. Um, what does that mean in terms of traffic? Um, so to give you a little bit of an idea, and this is from early on in the measurement, the traffic is a little bit more now. Um, what we did is we run this measurement from within one of the data centers that SurfNet has a point of presence in, and um, the dark red and light red is all traffic generated by all users on our network. And we have over a million people on our network. The blue part is our measurement. So we generate more DNS traffic than all our more than a million users combined. So we generate quite a bit of traffic. But as you can see, it's not a lot of traffic in terms of volume, right? It's uh, maybe 250 megabits, a little bit more now, but it's not a lot of traffic but it is a lot of very small packets. Um, and um, what we actually did, most of our traffic will go to the TLD servers because for every domain that we request, we will have to find the delegation point. So we have to talk to the TLD servers. Um, and obviously, um, the biggest TLD out there is .com, which is operated by a company called VeriSign. Um, so we reached out to them and said, oh, do you see our traffic? And is it a lot? Um, and they, uh, they said, oh, well, we hadn't noticed a huge change, but can you tell us what the IP ranges are? And then I told them, and they said, yes, we can see your traffic. Um, they, they, they said it was a non-trivial amount of traffic, um, but not disruptive, and they actually encouraged us to continue this type of work, so that was good. That's one box ticked. Of course, we want to do a responsible measurement, and if you're ever considering doing something like this, um, what we did was we obviously set up a website with clear contact and abuse information. We created sensible reverse DNS entries. Um, and the IP block info in the RIPE database actually t tells you where to find us, right? Um, because what we don't want is people to start blocking us, then our measurement suffers. But more importantly, we created something that ev other people suffer from, and we don't want this. And we have had one such instance this year where, um, due to a company suffering a denial of service attack, our queries to them were timing out. And this was a very, very large domain name registrar. And because our queries were timing out, our servers were sort of retrying and retrying and retrying and retrying and sending them lots of traffic, and they blocked us. Um, and they didn't block us because they, we were bothering them before. This was just a bad coincidence. Um, and so we tried reaching out to them, which was a pain, and it took us two months to reach the right person in the company to get ourselves unblocked. Even though we set up all of this, they apparently didn't find our contact info, didn't think about reaching out, which is fair. I mean, what we're doing is a measurement. It's not like we're one of their customers. Um, but what we learned from this is that even if you do all of this, people will still block you or not be able to find you. So, so keep that in mind when you set up these kinds of measurements. So of course, I'm a researcher, so I need to get funding for my research, right? Otherwise, I can't eat. Um, so we decided to call our um, project a big data project, right? Because big data gets you funding. Um, but then we had to ask ourselves, is what we're doing actually big data? Um, so we decided to, to compare it to something uh, that is generally considered to be big data, right? The human genome is three times two to the power of nine base pairs for an individual human like myself. 
Actually, if you're interested in DNA, there's going to be a talk uh, by Bert Huber of PowerDNS. It's going to be all about DNA. I think it's at 4 this afternoon. Um, and we collect about uh, 2 billion DNS records per day. So we're not quite a human genome, but close. And since February 2015, we have collected over 1.7 times 10 to the power of 12. So that's 1.7 trillion in human money. Uh, or 563 human genomes, so that's more, peop more people than are in the room right now. But it's fewer people than are at Shah. And, uh, oh, yeah, so I'm, I'm working on big data, right? And, and I mean, seriously, big data, it's huge. Um, so what do we use um, to, uh, uh, to, to run this project? Well, if you do big data, the, the only tool chain you really want to go to is something like Hadoop. So together with a couple of partners, uh, Surfnet, SIDN is the registry for .NL, and the university, we bought our, bought our own Hadoop cluster. Um, and we use all of the tool chain that's available on there. But in particular, we used uh, a tool called Impala, which is a SQL query engine that I'll show you some examples of later on, um, which we use to analyze our data. Um, and actually, because we are publicly funded, we try to make our data openly available. Unfortunately, we can't do that with all of the data we collect. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about the data that we do make public later on as well. Um, and then, of course, on top of that, if we want students to process the data, we run something like a Jupyter Notebook so they can run their Python code straight on top of the Hadoop cluster and analyze the data. And in fact, we have collected so much data that we had to extend our little cluster. And June this year, uh, we added another eight nodes. So we now have our nice little cluster in the data center. I, liked, I really enjoyed wiring that up. So all I've told you about now is that we collect data, that we collect tons of data. But what do you do with that, right? Can you do something useful with that? And I'm going to talk to you about four examples of things that we have done with this data uh, that I think might be of interest to this particular crowd. And the first example is something called snowshoe spam. Who's familiar with the term snowshoe spam? Raise your hands, please. Very few people. Well, two. That's very few people. So like the TLDR is that snowshoe spam is a particular variant of spam um, in which the, the people that try to send you the spam try to spread out the load of sending spam over lots of hosts and lots of domain names, lots of IP addresses. So you can liken it to a snowshoe, which is one of these funny tennis rackets that you tie to your shoes if you want to walk in the snow. That's where the name comes from. Um, the problem with this particular type of spam that it's hard to blacklist because they send it from lots of different IPs. They say they take, for instance, 40 or 50 IPs that are in a single prefix but then don't use all of them, so you can't blacklist the whole prefix. It's a pain blacklisting every individual IP. Um, but what we found when we started looking at our data is that the domains that are set up for this type of spam are actually um, recognizable in the sense that they are anomalous if you compare them to other domains. And in particular, um, if you look at two examples, which is an anomalous number of A records or an anomalous number of MX records, these are plots created by, uh, by one of our students where he took the long tail of our data set, so domains that are already anomalous because they have um, more records than other domains. And then what he did is he took domains that were blacklisted and compared them to domains that are whitelisted. And he took a couple of uh, uh, spam blacklists, such as the ones from Spam House, but also from other organizations. And then he compared domains. And what you could see is that blacklisted domains were much more likely to have many A records. Um, in fact, um, you, you can see that, for instance, there's a gap of seven records at the, what is it, 75th? percentile, and there's a gap of 17 records at the 90 percentile. Um, and for MX records, it's more or less the same. Um, you can see the red graph veering off towards the right way earlier than the blue one. And, and basically what that says is that domains that were blacklisted because they were marked as spam are much more likely to have many MX records in them. So what we currently have is we have a master student who is almost ready, uh, so he's finishing up writing a paper about this. His defense is actually the end of this month. And this was a collaboration between the university and Surfnet. 
Now, SurfNet has a mail filtering service for our constituency, which is higher education and research in the Netherlands. And uh, we filter about 10 to 15 million emails per day. So we're, it's not a huge processing uh, uh, service, but we do see quite a bit of traffic. About 50% of that is considered spam. Um, at least that's the statistics that my colleagues gave me. Um, and what we learned is that with this research that we do, we can actually improve real-world email security. Now, I'm going to give you some prelim preliminary results here. Um, they're going to be a little bit hard to read on the screen, but the takeaway is that basically for every domain, you see two uh, rows, and the top row uh, is the spam score. Redder is spammer. Just so blue is probably not spam according to the mail filtering system. Red is this has been marked as spam, and every block is a single day. Now, the, um, if it's green, that means that that domain was already blacklisted. If it's purple, that means that the methodology that the student uh, developed detected this domain as uh, probably malicious. Uh, and what you can see is that there are, of course, um, con uh, control domains that um, this, the, the methodology of the student finds, but they're already blacklisted. So there, the method that he developed doesn't add very much because it was already on a blacklist, so that domain would have already have been filtered. But if you go further down, you can actually see that his method detects domains before they appear on a blacklist. Um, and the bottom graph shows you how many days earlier he detects it than it appears on a blacklist. Um, and while the majority is only a few days, um, we have outliers going up to f uh, over uh, uh, 50 days um, where he detects the domain as probably set up to send spam more than 50 days before it appears on the blacklist. So this is interesting, and he's writing this up as a paper. So the second example I want to give you is something called crafted domains. Anybody familiar with the term? Oh, very few. Okay. So. Everybody know what the DNS amplification is? Who doesn't? Good. <laughs> I'm at the right conference. Um, so DNS amplification is still one of the most frequently used attacks or to perform volumetric DDoS attacks. Um, and if you are an attacker, basically you have two ways of doing this. You can either abuse a DNS signed domain, which is something that's been popular um, over the past, say, three to four years. Um, because a DNSSEC domain, assigned domain, of course, has lots of signature in it, signatures in it, you have keys in it, and that means your responses are going to be large, so you can use that to perform uh, denial of uh, amplification attacks. The other option is, of course, to craft a domain, where as an attacker, you configure your domain such that you almost have a guaranteed bang for your buck. And typically, what you will do is you put in a few large text records, or you cram in a lot of A records that simply inflates the size of your responses when you send a query for this name. Um, and we decided to look for these kinds of domains in our data set. And while we didn't find hundreds of domains, um, we did find tens of domains, and most of them were actually abused. And, and there, there's one example of such a domain on this slide here. And what the graph shows you is basically um, in March of 2015, all the way on the left-hand side of the graph, the domain is not large, not inflated yet. So it's not configured to perform attacks. But then, as you can see, as time progresses, um, they're adding lots of A records to it, which makes the response for this domain uh, pretty large. And how can I tell that these are not legitimate A records? Now they're all um, local hosts. So they're all 127.0.0.1.2.3.4.5. Why are they all different? Because a, re a resolver can't collapse them to a single response if they're all different. Um, then, with thanks to Christian Rosso and Johannes Krupp from the University of the Saarland in Germany, we got some data from a project called Ampot. Uh, and if you don't know this project, look it up. It's pretty interesting. What they did was they designed something that, can, that functions as an amplifier for lots of protocols, including DNS and NTP and other UDP protocols. And they try to become part of attack swarms. Um, and they want to do this in order to figure out if people are performing attacks and what kind of attacks they are performing and what they are attacking. And we, uh, so the, the, the area indicated by the arrow in the middle is actually a period over which attacks were observed that used this domain. 
So this domain was actually used for DNS amplification attacks. So what are some other examples we found? So attackers are pretty creative. Um, we found one that has, and I'll show, I'll show you the content of that one on the next slide, that has parts of a speech by President Obama on net neutrality. So I can't wait what crap from Mr. Trump they're going to put in there next. Um, you find that they sometimes put um, random garbage in there. They'll put mildly offensive language in there. Um, they will have high numbers of A records in uh, odd prefixes. 1.0 1 uh, 1 slash 8 is used for all sorts of research. It's not actually, as far as I know, routable. Um, and let's see, we had... Oh, it's not on this one. But we had one that also had an excerpt from um, the US federal budget for 2016. I have no clue why they did that. So this first one with the speech from President Obama, if you want to read it, look up the slides later on. Um, as you see, it has lots of text. It's about net neutrality, this speech. Oh, I don't know what they attacked with it. Maybe uh, companies that violate net neutrality. Maybe they attacked Verizon with it. I don't know. Um, but the takeaway here is that this domain was actually observed in over 8,000 attacks. Um, so it was abused. The fact that we can find these domains in our data set, and actually, as the graph showed you, we can find them before they are abused, uh, gives us a window of opportunity to take action against these types of crafted domains. And it also gives you an opportunity to um, see if you can find the people that set up these domains, because they'll typically register the domain, um, which they'll need to register through uh, a commercial company. Um, and typically, they use one of these who is anonymizers. But still, the more time you have, that you know that this has been set up, the more time you have to find the guys that were doing this. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, why not just use DNSSEC for DDoS, right? Because many people claim that DNSSEC is just an amplification nightmare, no need to craft domains, just use what is out there. And this is actually a graph from a bit of research that I uh, conducted during my PhD, which shows you on the left-hand side, the gray area, that's, say, a control group of normal domains. All the colored lines on the right are DNSSEC signed domains, and the, um, on the X axis is the amplification factor that you can achieve. So the takeaway here is DNSSEC is a way worse amplifier than uh, regular DNS, so why not just use that? And actually, there are people that claim that the amplification is a reason not to deploy DNSSEC. Now, I'm not going to go into detail. There are good reasons to deploy it anyway, and there are actually ways to um, get, do away with the amplification. There are ways to solve that. But hey, who needs DNSSEC if you have .tel? Um, this is one of those new, well, it's not a new GTLD, but it's in the list of new GTLDs. Um, it has something to do with telephony. I'm, I'm not sure what you're supposed to do with it. But people, for some reason, put lots of big text records in there. Um, and this is a, a CDF plot for uh, oh, about three and a half thousand, no, sorry, it's about almost 5,000 domains um, that have text records in them. Uh, and if you add all those text records together, you get a certain size if you send a query for this. Uh, and there were three and a half thousand domains with over a thousand bytes of text records, so that gives you a decent amplification because you can send a small query, you get a big response, nice amplification. But we found people with over 54,000 bytes of text records that you can get back in a single response. Why? That's like, wh what the fuck are these people doing? Doesn't make any sense to do that, but might not be so bad because if it's over four kilobytes, probably the response is not going to get transmitted if you send a DNS query because it gets truncated and you have to retry over TCP. But hey, there's lots to pick from below four kilobytes that you can use for attacks. The nice thing about this one is that mostly what people will do if they perform an amplification attack is they'll send an any query. And there is a draft circulating in the IETF to do away with any queries because they're mostly abused for amplification attacks. But this is just a text query that I did, right? That's a legitimate query. You can't block that. Um, so this doesn't make any sense. Oh, and it gets worse. Um, I assume that many of you will be familiar with what is called Hanlon's maxim, which is never attribute to malice that which can adequately explain by stupidity. Um, if you go through our data set, you will find the weirdest stuff in text records. 
we find snippets of HTML, JavaScript, Windows PowerShell code that allows you to configure your built-in DNS server. Why is that in a text record? Um, PEM encoded X509 certificates. Really, you want to configure that in your web server, not put it in the DNS people. Um, snippets of DNS zone files, so it's sort of a self-recursion. Um, really, you cannot make this shit up. But we have a winner. And the winner puts their RSA private key <laughs> in the DNS. And, and, and for ethical reasons, I didn't put the whole key up there, but oh. Uh, and he's not the only one. Why, people? Why? Why? Seriously. But it's, I mean, as a hobby project, at some point I'm going to see if, if I can figure out whether the public key that belongs to this pops up somewhere in a certificate or a PGP or whatever. But this is just plain stupid. Right. So the fun doesn't stop there, um, because I have two more examples. And one of them, uh, the, the third one of them is CEO fraud. Um, who here knows what CEO fraud is? Ah, that's more people. OK. Who here has received CEO fraud emails? Oh, a few people. Did you find them convincing? More or less. Yeah, that's the, that's the problem with these. Um, so August 30 last year, about a year ago, our CERT team reports an incident of CEO fraud that was targeting us, Surfnet. So somebody was pretending to be our CEO. And actually, this was quite a sophisticated uh, campaign. Because they had, not only had they learned the name of our uh, managing director and were they sending us emails in correct, gra grammatically correct Dutch, um, which for most foreigners is quite challenging. Um, and they registered domain names that looked like our domain name. So they went quite far. Right? They registered something called surfnet-nl.net. And there was also one sent to my university, u20-nl.net. Um, and the problem with CEO fraud is that these campaigns can actually be quite sophisticated. They learn quite a lot about your company. They, they try to figure out whether your CEO is on holiday. And they target your financial department and then ask them very helpfully, maybe I need to transfer money to this foreign company and I can't figure it out. Can you help me? Um, attackers wouldn't do this if it didn't work, right? Um, but this is also quite costly for attackers because, as you'll see later on in this campaign, they had to register quite a few domain names and they actually have to pay to do that. So later that day, so August 30 last year, um, we start getting more reports that there, there have been others in the surf community that were targeted with similar emails. And then um, our CERT team re received, uh, through one of their communication channels, a longer list of domains, including more names in our community. So we could reach out to these people and warn them. Um, but then we thought, oh, OK. Uh, and we have a, a skirt is a, our a security community, so all our um, uh, constituents can talk sort of in a private area about security concerns. But we decided if we could find out more about this campaign using our Open Intel platform. So what we wanted to do, and here I'm going to show you a little bit how we use Impala, um, is what can we find uh, for these domains? So the first thing I did was look for what record types do we actually have in the data set for the surfnet-nl.net domain? Um, who can tell me what, I'm, what is missing here? Wave your hand. Yeah? Yeah, I heard it already. A records, quad A records. So all I have is MX records, NS records, text records, and an SOA record, but no A and quad A records. So this domain was probably set up just to send email. OK, if it's set up to end, uh, handle email, who's handling their email? So let's look up the MX address that we have in the data set. Oh, it's outlook.com. So they are using Office 365. They probably had to pay for that, right? They have a paid account uh, with Microsoft. OK, so if they're using Office 365, they may have one of these Microsoft-specific tokens in there. The, what you see at the bottom, MSC, ID, and then some Base64 encoded stuff. Um, Microsoft puts that in text records if you use their managed DNS service. Um, oh, and they protected uh, their domain against email forgery, right? They were very helpful and included in SPF records, so they wouldn't get marked as spam. Um, 
But what's nice about this token is that that token is linked to the account, not to the specific domain of the user. So what can we do? Well, we put this token in a, in a SQL query, and we ask our system, do you know of any other domains that use the same token? Um, and this is in the .NET dataset. So we found another 17 domains that have the same token. OK, says it's not a huge hit. So let's look in .com. Oh, we find 199 domains in .com that have this same token. So basically, using our data set, we could sort of take domains that we'd seen before and find domains that were part of the same campaign. And we scripted that. Um, and we had an input list when we uh, uh, collected data from various sources. The input list contained around about 860 domains. And by looking them up in, uh, uh, in our data set, we've, we managed to find an additional uh, almost 1,400 domains. Um, and that allowed us to warn people. And the pattern that we'd seen before was stuff where they would take the um, uh, CCTLD of the original domain and then put it in front and then register it in .net or .com. But we found other ones like Groupon, where they substitute O's by zeros, or overstoppen.com, where they substitute another O by a zero. And there are other examples of these kinds of changes in domain names. We used this in this campaign to warn people, and this had direct operational applications. Uh, and we, eventually, we, we shared this list with uh, the National Cybersecurity Center in the Netherlands as well, so they could inform other people, because we figured out there were banks in there, um, notary offices. So they were targeting quite a wide range of companies in the uh, Dutch society. Right. So now we get to the last example. Unless you've been hiding under a rock, you're aware that Dyn was attacked October last year. Uh, who was hiding under a rock? One person, two people? OK. So for those two people, Dyn is a company that provides managed DNS services. Um, they, were, they, had, they suffered a massive DDoS attack. Uh, there are sources that claim it was over one terabit of traffic that they had to process, but that's alleged. So there is no confirmation that that actually happened. Um, but the main problem is they went down on their US, US East Coast operations. Um, they were attacked using the Mirai botnet, the Internet of Shit. And um, this affected a number of large internet brands that were their customers. So um, Netflix was affected, Twitter, eBay, PayPal, LinkedIn. Not everybody was affected as badly as some. But for instance, PayPal went down completely on US East Coast. Um, this is an illustration of putting all your eggs in one basket. If you outsource your DNS to a company to protect yourself against DDoS attacks, and they suffer something that they can't process, you go down as well. So what does that do with people? Well, what we did was we looked at our data set in the aftermath of the attack. And there is a quite a dramatic change. The red line are customers that exclusively use Dyn services. So if you look at the NS record set for them, they will exclusively have Dyn NS records. The blue line are people that don't just have Dyn NS records, but they also have NS records for other operators. The black line is the, the day of the attack. And as you can see, there is a dramatic change. If you read the um, scales on the graphs, you can see it's actually a few percent change, because the, the scale is different on the left and on the right. But I wanted to put this in one figure so it's easier to see. In total, is about 5,000 domain names where they change from exclusive use to non-exclusive use. Um, but those 5,000 domains contain lots of big internet names, such as Twitter, Netflix, PayPal. Um, and, uh, but also some other companies, and, and this talk was called Digging in the DNS. There is a large company, manufacturer of earth moving equipment, is one of the companies that changed. Um, we studied this a little bit more because we wanted to learn what this does to a company that provides these kinds of services, such as Dyn. Um, and we wanted to see if it cost them any customers. The top graph is the period uh, from October 1st until December 31st of 2015. The bottom graph is the same period, but then in 2016. So that's the period in which the attack takes place. 
At the top, you can, uh, uh, you can see that there are very few people that actually um, leave Dyn. So their customers are quite loyal. Um, we saw in the same period, um, the year before the attack, we saw only one big change, and that was a company called Zalando. They sell shoes and other stuff, leather bags. Um, and they had lots of typo squatting domains, sort of defensive registrations of typo squatting domains. For some reason, they were using Dyn for that, as if somebody was going to attack their, their typo squatting domain. I have no clue why. Um, but they uh, left Dyn. Now, as you can see, the day after the attack, quite a few people decided to completely disc ditch Dyn, go away, and you see a little bit of after effect after the attack. But this is not a trend that continues. So it doesn't really affect Dyn as a company. Um, people still stay with them, and actually new customers still register. So let's look at new customers. Um, what we wanted to see if new customers are exclusive users or non-exclusive users. Um, and the top graph is over the entire data set uh, until the middle of last month. Um, orange is new customers that are non-exclusive. Blue is new customers that are exclusive. And there is only one major event of a, customer, a new customer choosing to be a non-exclusive customer, and that is the good adult content providers of Pornhub. Um, do I have to explain the irony of Pornhub going non-exclusive, or can you do the math yourself? Um, the aftermath of the attack is the bottom graph. And what you can see there is that we see no evidence of a significant change in behavior of new customers. So new customers still almost always decide to use Dyn exclusively rather than mixing Dyn with another operator. OK, what about people switching from exclusive use to non-exclusive use? So blue means people switch to non-exclusive. Orange means people switch to exclusive use. So they were non-exclusive, and they go to exclusive. It's kind of hard to read on this screen, um, but there are two takeaways. There are two major events of people switching from non-exclusive use to exclusive use, and almost all of these are people fixing an error in their DNS configuration where they had a .local NS record in their NS set, and the rest was all dying. Don't ask me why. They fixed that. There's two separate events where they do that. Um, Above the x-axis, you see the blue. And you can clearly see that the top graph is the entire data set. You can see that after the attack, so October last year, you see a major change. You see lots of people switching to non-exclusive use. And if we zoom in a little bit, uh, and this is the bottom graph, um, what you can see is that there is a real trend change. There are still people switching from exclusive to non-exclusive use today in the aftermath of the attack. So somehow people did pick up on this, and they are changing their behavior. Whether or not that partly has to do with the fact that Dyn was acquired by Oracle, I don't know. But it might play a role. So what are the takeaways from this fourth example? Well, my goal is not to bash Dyn, because I know people that work there. They're good people. It's not. Um, uh, uh, it's a company that's existed for a long time. This can happen to even the largest providers. If you say you prevent DDoS attacks, you also paint a target on yourself. right? If you are Cloudflare, or if you're Dyn, or if you're Verisign, or Akamai, or whatever, you paint a target on yourself, everybody can attack you. And we have other examples of big providers, either through mis mismanagement or attacks going down. Um, I think it was early this year, Amazon S3 service went down. Um, OVH, very large uh, platform as a, uh, um, infrastructure as a service provider, uh, suffered over one terabit of uh, attack traffic, went down. Um, but the takeaway here is that the internet was, of course, uh, designed to be distributed, right? And we break that assumption. 
by putting all our eggs in one basket and going to few of these large providers that we outsource our services to. And this is not just outsourcing DNS to Dyn. This is outsourcing your email to Google um, or Microsoft. Uh, we are breaking that assumption. And as an internet community, this is something we need to think about. Because many of the original assumptions on which the internet was built no longer hold in today's commercial internet market. And you can have these kinds of things happening if you break these assumptions. Right. Um, so what are we doing uh, with this data, and how are we continuing to work with this? Well, one of the things that we want to do is do more proactive threat detection, like we did with the snowshoe spam example and the uh, crafted domain example. Uh, and we actually managed to get funding for a PhD position. Um, and um, we actually already hired a student who is starting uh, in the third quarter of this year. Um, we are also working on another project proposal. There is a joint call for cybersecurity proposals that um, closes end of August. We're submitting something to that, and we hope to have another PhD position in the Netherlands uh, that we fund with that. I have a student from the Technical University of Eindhoven finishing a project. We want to measure adoption of secure email practices, such as using Start TLS in Dane. Um, and uh, later this year, we're going to do some cool visualizations based on this data that we hope to put up on our website. Because, of course, we're academics, so we have a really boring HTML-only website with text. And we want some nice figures on there so people actually get a feeling for the power of this kind of data. If you are interested in data access, we share data with other academic researchers. Um, we have to be a little bit careful because we sign contracts to get some of these TLD zones. And while we are allowed to use the data for research, we almost definitely are not allowed to use it for commercial purposes. Um, some of the data we have is already open access, and you can access it through our website. Um, and we can always find a middle ground. If we can't give you access to the data, we can give you access to public data sets and then run, run queries on your behalf once you've tuned your queries. If you want to learn more about our project, please go visit our website. Um, we published a paper about the design of the system last year, um, which you can find through the URL, but you can also find a link on the website. If you're interested in how we designed the system, look up the paper and give it a read. Um, send me an email, find me on Twitter, find me on LinkedIn um, if you have any questions. Uh, that was my talk. Um, and if you have any questions, now is the time to ask. Thank you very much, Roland. Um, if you have questions, please line up at the microphone just a second. Um, if you're leaving the room, please be quiet. The audience, the, the acoustics in the tents are really aw awful. If you haven't noticed, outside it's raining, so I would suggest <laughs> staying and asking questions. First question, please. Yeah. Do you have a list of top-level domains where you have not the possibility to get the entire zone file? For instance, do you get also the .mil domain or any others? Which, which one? The dot? The dot mil. Mil. U US military. No, we don't get that one. Uh, but we do actually have most of dot gov, because that is open data. Uh, so we have dot fed, dot us, and dot gov, because that is published as open data, because Congress forced them to do that. Uh, dot mil, obviously, we don't have. Um, and you're grinning, so you have the data. What? Or uh, no. <laughs> no, no, only <okay. laughs> for information, maybe there are other top level domains that yeah, so are not. Uh, give you the entire uh, yes. top-level domain. That's content. true. So what we um, the, actually the, the the hardest people to get data from are the country code top-level domains, the CCTLDs, because the generic TLDs um, have to have a means to share their data. This is a requirement from ICANN. Um, so most of them we can actually set up a contract with, but the CCTLDs have their own bylaws, and especially the European CCTLDs are reluctant to release their data. Um, because they say, well, it's privacy sensitive and we can't release it under European privacy regulations. I would argue this is not true because we have data from a number of uh, European CCTLDs. Um, but it's mostly the CCTLDs that are actually the hardest to get data from. So if you know people at a CCTLD or you work at one and you want to give me your data, <laughs> please. <laughs> Let's talk later, Brad. Okay. <laughs> 
Next question, please. Hi, uh, what's the reason you're not collecting PTR records, as in reverse DNS? Okay, yeah, that, that's a good question. So, um, there, there are basically there are, there are two reasons for that. A, there are already projects that do this uh, at a large scale. For instance, uh, the people that uh, develop Bind, so ISC, runs a yearly PTR scan. And that data doesn't change very frequently, so they run a, a yearly scan that they publish. Um, actually, um, right at the beginning of my talk, I told you I'm operationally responsible for uh, SurfNet's DNS infrastructure. There are people running very, very bad PTR scans that show up in my data set because we have most of a slash eight in IP space. Um, these people are really annoying, and I, I don't want to be one of these annoying people. <laughs> okay, thank you. Next, qu next question. Thank you. Um, in your graph showing your query volume, it seemed as if you were not doing any queries um, at midnight. So is there a reason why you don't do 24-7 scanning? That's a very good question. I, I didn't actually explain that. Um, well observed. So we want to do a measurement for every domain once every 24 hours. That means we start our queries at midnight UTC. Uh, but we also want to finish our entire measurement before the next midnight UTC. So we leave some extra space where we're not sending queries, or we might be sending one or two batches because there were changes to the zones during the day. But actually, our querying completely stops before midnight and then restarts at midnight which also makes us very recognizable if you're receiving traffic from us, because we will start exactly at midnight UTC. Okay, thank you. Next one. Yeah, uh, thank you. So if I understood it correctly, you look at domain names just below the top level domain. Yeah? So, but what happens if you have a hoster in between, which has clients which uh, register domains with a hoster for some malicious content, or one malicious domain which only hosts its malicious content in a subdomain? Yeah. Do you look at those as well, or do you think this is not an important thing to look at? No, that's, that's, that's a good question. So you uh, understood correctly that we only go for uh, the second level domains under a TLD. Um, and we ask for the www label for A and quad A, but we don't go into third or fourth or whatever level. Unless there is a C name there, in which case we will expand it and go in. Um, what we also do is we have some measurements where we take hit lists. So they are, for instance, uh, RBLs with do longer domain names on them that we will also measure. Um, but the, the trick there is that um, we have to have added value with the measurement that we do, right? We, we want to measure something that somebody else isn't measuring already. And these sec third or fourth level domains often show up in passive DNS uh, setups. Um, and we can use those as a hit list to uh, do a measurement on our end, but it does have to make sense, right? So what we're doing now is we're doing this for a few RBLs to see if we observe changes. Uh, for instance, there's a takedown or whatever, we observe changes, that is interesting. But of course, we have no way to work out what exists in the namespace if we don't know what to look for. And what we definitely don't want to do is do some sort of dictionary querying or brute force, because then we're going to generate traffic volumes that are just going to be too big. Thanks. We still have a few minutes left, so if you have any further questions, please do come up to the microphone. And if you do, uh, please uh, either move, move rather close to the microphone so we can understand you better. I'm not closer, closer, closer. Closer, 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 yes. Uh, ah. I'm not 100% familiar with all the intricacies of the top-level domain, domain name system, but what happens if you do the queries from like inside China? Do you see different things? Is that possible? Because um, you only measure from the Netherlands, which is quite safe, hopefully. But uh, it should be yes. Um, should I could have would have. So no, this, this is this is a this is a good question. So I'm going to make it a little bit more general, which is why do you not measure from multiple vantage points, right? Yes. Um, two answers to that. Answer number one. Um, we already generate quite a lot of traffic, so the more vantage points we set up, the more traffic we generate. Why? Well, we want to be a little bit careful with that. Um, most of the, uh, there are people that claim that most of the internet is already scans, and we don't want to sort of add more to that. Um, we did actually set up a secondary vantage point in the US um, to, to do a measurement, uh, together with uh, uh, CADA is a, uh, at the University of California, San Diego. Um, and one of the things that we want to do is, what differences do we see? Now, obviously, you have things like CDNs, 
um, that will give you a response based on your geolocation, but there is already a lot of research going into working out how these CDNs work. So that's not a goal of our measurement. And to answer your original question, what if you do this from China? Well, from China, you'll hit, of course, the Great Firewall, um, which will block certain domains and, and return you um, uh, uh, data that whatever the, the Chinese government puts in there. Um, it's, there are ethical issues with those types of measurements, because um, where do you then do this measurement? Do we do this with our Chinese colleagues who operate the research network there? What do we expose them to if we start sending lots of queries for stuff that their government doesn't want them to query? So we try to steer clear of that. Actually, we did um, another measurement um, last year where one of the things that we did was uh, um, uh, do a, a scan for open resolvers. And our, our scan hit the Great Firewall, and we got some responses back from that. Um, and that, they send back really weird stuff. You send them a, a, a quad A query, and they'll send you an A record back. So I have no clue what they're doing. I try to steer clear of that um, for ethical reasons. Thank you. Yeah. What? OK. He hasn't asked a question yet. <laughs> OK, thanks. Um, if you observe records with a low TTL and change every day, do you want to scan them more than once a day to get a better? better yeah, that's a good measurement? question. Um, so to answer to that, because we, we use a resolver in between, right? So the cache of the resolver um, will actually uh, um, ensure that if something is cached for, for um, the TTL, it will expire. We can query it again. We don't store the TTL. Um, what we want is a predictable data set. So if the TTL is short and it might change more often, then of course we could query more often, but how do you scale this, right? Because if there is one thing then that, that is observable in DDNS, it's a trend in TTLs going down. Uh, there's a paper from two years ago where they, they had a study where they looked at TTLs observed in A and quad A records. Uh, and this was a repeat of a study that was done uh, in the early 2000s. And in the early 2000s, the median for TTL for A and quad A records was about an hour. And when they repeated this study two or three years ago, the median was 60 seconds. Um, we can't feasibly send queries every 60 seconds. We have no way to make that scale, and I don't want to break the internet <laughs> with my queries. Okay, we, we have time for one more or two more quick questions, if there are quick answers. Anyone? Any takers? Come on. <laughs> and close to the microphone, please. Yes, you have to bend down. OK. Uh, recently, uh, I stumbled upon a Twitter user called DNS Stream, who regularly informs the con community when an in NS record changes or whether there's a random subdomain attack on some sort of DNS uh, domain. Do you know who that is? Or is it probably by any chance you and your project? Oh, OK. So no, I, it's not me. Uh, I follow that account as well. <laughs> um, and. I have, an, I have a, a hunch who it might be, um, so I can tell you in person, um, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so, last, last call for questions. We can fit another one in if anybody's interested. No? So, I would say thank you very much, Roland. Please give him a warm round of applause.